Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Luke Bible Study with Pastor Robert. We hope that you dive deeply into Scripture as you draw nearer to God. Thanks for joining us, and have a great study. Good evening, Zoomers. Welcome. I see a couple of you on tonight. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Hi, Robert. Too, right? This is Hi, not Robert. the Chinese balloon coming to you from outer space. Hi, Hi Robert. It's Hi, Wednesday Robert. night. Luke's study. Good. I see some hands waving. Thank you. I'm glad you're on board. Right. We've got an excellent um, word of scripture tonight. I mean, Luke chapter 15, it's very endearing for us uh, people walking with Jesus Christ, the, the lost parables. Um, so I, I pray it's a blessing for you Zoomers who are on with us and for our live study who is here. So let's turn right to the text right away, Luke 15, and we're looking for someone who will um, be kind enough to read the holy text for us and, and just open us with a word of prayer. Somebody from our live study, anybody game to do that? I appreciate that. And if, yeah, so let's read uh, chapter 15 and then open us with a brief word of prayer then too. Here we go. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field, fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fat calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fat calf for him. 
My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Father, we are that lost son. Thank you for providing a way of salvation mm -hmm. for us. Thank you for the privilege of being known as a child of the king. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you for this time of studying your word. Thank you for Pastor Robert Lita leading us. We pray uh, an anointing of your Holy mm -hmm. Spirit upon him afresh and anew tonight. And upon our ears and our minds and our hearts that we might receive the teaching and that we might put it into practice in our lives. We glorify you. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. And we love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, my title tonight, The Gospel of Lost and Found. Not the lost and found bin where you pick up the items you left behind in church. <laughs> But the gospel, this is a powerful chapter about the gospel and powerful insights, yes, into, into sin, into lostness, into uh, salvation, and into God's uh, mercy uh, upon us. So let's look right away. Roman 1, the context, verses 1 and 2, set us off. There are two groups of people identified uh, for us in verses 1 and 2. The first group are the tax collectors and sinners and who are they gathering around Christ yep and in verse 2 the second group of people we're identifying yeah the religious leaders the elite the ones who should be right setting the example and leading um, to uh, a relationship with God and in Christ and so we see these two groups uh, are the context of these powerful, wonderful parables. And there are two responses, letter B, two responses. Those who are the outsiders, the tax collectors and sinners, have what response to Christ? Yes, they, they, they're attracted to him like a magnet. They're coming around. And how many of them are coming around to Christ? All of them. I mean, wow. There, there's an attractiveness to Christ and his teaching and his preaching. Then we have the second response noted in verse two, the religious leaders who should be setting the example of a, a, a life and relationship with God have what kind of response to Christ? <laughs> mutter, 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 mutter. Yeah. The complaint and that he hangs out with sinners and eats with them, which uh, suggests what then? The religious leaders are saying, what about Jesus? He hangs out with sinners and eats with them. Okay, he, he, he yeah, takes one to no one. He must be one. And certainly Jesus is unclean because he's hanging out with these sinners. He is an unclean person. You oughtn't consider him than, you know, to be from God for that reason. So uh, the Pharisees, we understand, of course, have a wrong heart and mindset about Jesus. We figured that out from the Gospel of Luke. All we need to do is read certain rabbinic writings of the Pharisees, and we find out that, that they would teach there's joy in heaven when lawbreakers die. That was a Pharisaic response to tax collectors and sinners. When they die, heaven rejoices that the lawbreakers die. And we're going to see Jesus reversing that whole thing. It's when the lawbreakers come and repent that there's rejoicing in heaven. He just turns upside down the prevalent philosophy and false belief of, of the religious um, leaders. So uh, question number one, please, to get us thinking on this text, Jesus attracted sinners. Um, are the ministries of our church doing the same? Sinners, yes. <laughs> Good. There's a humility there because we could have answered in the fair sake way. We could have answered, well, you know, those dirty tax collectors and sinners are out there for a reason. 
you know, we could have answered that way. So, you know, this it, it, it's a convicting question that we need to continuously evaluate uh, because we know where Christ has drawn us from. And Jesus, in his teaching and preaching, was a magnet for people who are lost. So God help us in our transition season here at WCC that we remember our lostness and where Christ has brought us from and knowing that there's hundreds of people. I mean, we, we could be planting dozens of satellite churches right in this location if we were attracting sinners to the gospel and person of Jesus. I, 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 I don't believe this is, yes, Jesus is God. We can also say that, that, well, it only worked because he's God. Well, this is Christ in us. And the same word he preached is now for us to proclaim. And, and I believe the word has power to draw sinners to Christ. I believe that. And we need to keep reminding ourselves and, of course, keep building relationships with, with uh, people <coughs> who are not interested in this church of people who are not interested in Jesus, right. To continuously build bridges uh, to yes, them, sir. please. Uh, just in subject of being attracted to sinners. I heard this about the accident after it happened. Okay. I don't know if it was somebody from the church here or not, but a woman uh, saw how distressed the woman that T-boned, the other car was, and she went up and put her arms around her and mm. her, saw her. Just, what a wonderful. Yep. There's the gospel in action. <laughs> Let's go to number two right away, please. And we'll work on this together. What do the three parables that we heard read now, we've read them together and we've looked at them. What do they have in common, the three barrels? We're looking for elements that all three of the parables have in common. Did you catch that in the reading? I heard somebody, who's going to start us here? Okay, so so two things we just mentioned. Let's start with the first one. There's somebody lost or something lost in each of the parables. In verse four, it's a sheep. In verse eight, it's a coin. In verse 24, the same word lost shows up, and of course, it's applied to a, a son. Secondly, every one of the parables has this issue of sought. Something or someone is being sought. In verse 4, the person goes after the lost sheep. In verse 8, the woman carefully searches. Now, catch this and make a note right here and now. I'll I'll hold you on this one. Who does the searching in the parable of the son? He doesn't go out and search. The other son doesn't go out and search for the lost. The lost son searches himself. No, no, no. Because that doesn't match the man who searches for the sheep and the woman who searches for the coin. The point is, here's your dangling chat. Nobody is searching in the third parable. And this is what we are to notice. Now hold that thought because it'll be the end of the lesson where we answer this. Nobody is searching for the son in the third. And we're to notice this. Because the parallels of what's in common is the obvious things we're supposed to find. Number three, what else is common in the parables? There's still a couple other elements. So we have, there's something lost. There's something sought. Then something found. And of course, this verse five, it's a sheep. Verse nine, it's a coin. And verse 24, it's a sum. So we see the commonality. Then what else do we have in common in all three? Rejoice. Yes, you got it. The fourth item is the, the response of people. Verse six, the shepherd invites his friends and his neighbors. I mean, community. Verse nine, 
the woman invites friends and neighbors. This is a big, you know, and we all look at it and it's like, lady, maybe you ought to keep your house a little cleaner. But no, no, no. See, there, Jesus is building something here. And then in verse 24, the father invites, of course, the whole household staff. And we know from the fattened calf issue, who else is then being invited? Don't say the calf. Okay. I say the servants. Maybe. The household servants, we already mentioned that. Folks, the issue of the calf is the calf would have fed how many more people than your Swanson TV dinner? You didn't get it. The whole village is invited because nobody would make a fattened calf for just eight or 10 people. The whole village is invited in this particular scenario. Finally, the effects that we're supposed to understand about repentance. Each one of the parables uh, there's there's rejoicing in heaven, verse 7. There's rejoicing, verse 10, in the presence of the angels, which parallels the in heaven. So verse 7, verse 10. And in verse 32, it's a little bit more subtle. The father says in verse 32, we had to rejoice. That This is an automatic Because when a sinner is found, this is is the highlight of God's heart and mind. It's bigger than many other things in all of Holy Scripture. This is huge. We had to. This is a divine necessity because this is the heart of God, which is what is attractive to every callous sinner in this community that there is a god who right now is searching him or her churches who get this are magnets for sinners churches who resemble pharisees and religious leaders are nervous about sinners coming in and they present themselves sterile and you're out there because of the choices you've made and we've got to assess where we're at and how we even as church folks are responding in this this whole gospel parable so we've got this we know the gospel is attractive we know that jesus is attractive to to downright dirty sinners tax collectors and scoundrels and, and, and so our, our application up from last week to this week is, you know what, find, find a center and have dinner with them. Last week was, don't forget the dinner invitation list. Don't make it your church friends. Make it people who won't be able to return the blessing or the favor or, you know, such. Remember from last week? Tonight, I just bring that back up. It's the simplest way for us to begin a relationship with a non-believer. Invite them to Lakeshore, El Popo, or wherever your your favorite you know place is to to do it. And let's begin building relationships and and see how Jesus and His gospel is attractive to lost people. Uh, Roman two, the parable of the lost sheep. We just briefly look over it real quickly. There is a parable, a parallel text for this in Matthew eighteen, but we think Jesus spoke this parable of the lost sheep on several occasions so the man has a hundred sheep and he loses one question three if the shepherd in this parable is a picture of god which it certainly would be what is he doing while we i'm making our application right to us while we share the gospel with lost people what is the shepherd doing Okay, folks, I think I needed to learn this chapter over because I, yes, we we work on our gospel presentations. We work on sharing Jesus simply and basically, you know, with people. But I've got to keep in mind there is a greater shepherd who is doing work behind the scenes that I'm oblivious to. And I am dependent on that, right? For an open door with somebody who will not normally talk to me. Because I'm too straight laced. I need to make my hair go up in spikes or something and wear a dog collar with pokey things. I don't know what to call it. 
Do, do, do you see? See, there's a God who is doing work by providence, which is invisible and marvelous. Our stories have that, but we ourselves may not know what God did to bring us to himself. I, I think that's what Jesus shares with us in glory after the dinner table. He's going to, this is how my father got you. And you didn't know it for years. He was doing this. See, we are not alone in this endeavor. The father is searching and we are responsible to, to uh, call sinners to repentance, to call them to meet Jesus, right? We're, we're not going to abdicate that and say, okay, God, just do your thing. You know, I mean, fill our church with people who will get saved when, you know, Adam gives a gospel. Right. So this is really exciting. Now, the second question of question three, if the shepherd is a picture of the church, what are we to be doing regarding the lost? That's excellent. Yep. Our, our, what did you say? P- praying, praying. Yeah. Uh, you know that I've got a list of people. I'm specifically praying. God help me to you know, to, to enter a relationship with, a conversation with, yeah? A- anyone else? What is the church, to, uh, what, what are we to be doing if, if the church is the one who mobilizes mission to find lost people? Developing friendships and relationships Excellent. and loving, yeah. loving yeah. on them. Yeah, yeah, find somebody to connect with soon. I heard somebody else here too, though. Seek them out. Okay, yep, That this is a literal action for us each to take. God Help me to develop my list tonight of people that I know that I could, you know, begin seeking out. Well, I think being aware of situations, too. We had a funeral last week that we went to, and a a young lady that I'd known many, many, many years ago when she was little, we got to talking, and what is that? Where are you going to church? You know, how are you with Jesus? Good start. It was, it was yep. funerals, the best place. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you have a spiritual support system? I I'm love so it. She said, I'm, I'm starting to read the Bible now. And she sent me a picture of her. Okay. Yeah. Now. So, yeah. You know, How's it going? Yeah. yeah. Where did you decide to start? What book are you reading? Yeah. What What's God saying to you? Is there any way I can help support you in this time of grief or loss? Yeah. yeah. I appreciate that. (laughs) It is. It's not good to just gather friends. You have to be out there while we still have time. While while we have time. The pressure keeps getting more severe. It does. But the one thing is, if you're traveling and you just start up a conversation, Jeff and I have done this. Jesus, just call you say, and it's like, bang. Yep. And we did it on a trip to Texas there for four days and then four fish. Okay. But then you don't say God. Right. And everybody, everybody knows God and says God. But Jesus is the lightning. Jesus, yes. Yeah. I appreciate that. Great. Um, okay, I got to watch where I'm going here. So now, uh, repentance, of course, remind us of the road sign, you know, the, the issue of repentance, sinners turning around. What's the road sign? And there just aren't enough in our county. We need more U-turn signs. I'm going to pick it for it at City Hall so that there's a spiritual message with every U-turn, right? Yeah. So <laughs> repentance is a U-turn. I've been pursuing sin, and I'm going to go the exact opposite direction toward a specific person, Jesus Christ, right? And so that's the whole theme that we've got here. And we've got the issue of the lost sheep. And Jesus says the application, it's very, very powerful, right? Verse seven, the application he gives us, we don't have to guess, right? That when a sinner repents, heaven has a blast and going, yes, all that heaven put in behind the scenes of this, it, God is drawing people from darkness to light, and it's working, and they do their hallelujahs in glory, right? So um, Roman 3, the parable of the lost coin, just really briefly again, different circumstance. Now there's a woman. She's got 10, uh, some of your text, silver coins. The, the Greek is drachma. The drachma, 
was a day's wage. She had 10 of those. We suspect this is all she had, like the widow with the two mites. This is all she had. So, folks, that's why you're going to search every nook and cranny of your dirt floor house when you've lost one, because she's only got nine others, you see. So the, the urgency of, of the lostness of this coin, it's parallel, of course, to the sheep. She finds it. That's why she's calling friends and neighbors up where the rest of us would go, oh, whatever. It rolled under the wash machine. Somebody will get it someday, you know. You know, no, no, no. The urgency of this. And, and let's rejoice in verse 10, the application again. Angels in heaven are doing a jig. Oh, God, you, you did it. You, you were working. You, you, you were, you know, the hardness. Satan is no match for you. They're rejoicing, right? And sinners, you know, are, they, they are in God's hands. Uh, God loves to work and to draw uh, people who are, are bound in darkness and bring them back to himself, right? The mass celebration. And, and uh, you might want to know, you know, for those who repent, right? Heaven rejoices over those who repent. Is that a one-time repentance? Over each repentance? Yeah. I think they're doing it continuously. Yes. So many are repenting. Yes. Yeah. And repentance for a believer, bear in mind, is not the one time, you, you know, you got saved and converted. Because this is a present uh, tense uh, verb. This is a present tense verb. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who repents. That's a present tense, which means the action is ongoing. Luther said it's a life of repentance for a believer that we're continuously, you know, c- confessing that sin and being done with it. So it doesn't have an effect then upon me and my outreach to someone else. So it doesn't mean I, you know, I'm in my bad mood today. And that's when somebody who's an unbeliever says, Oh, there's that pastor guy in a bad mood today. It's like, yeah, we really want to go to his church. You see? So it's a life of repentance uh, for us that we're just short accounts with sin done, done and over. Okay. And now we get to the heart of what we want to do tonight, which is the parable of the lost Read it carefully. I'm throwing you a twist. I'm throwing you a twist. The parable of the lost sons. They're both lost. In fact, only one of them in this parable is found. The other who's on the inside moves outside of the feast and is lost. And the question is, will he ever come in with a relationship with the father? That's the dangling chad of of the parable. But the one who's profligate, the one who is just in the papers and on the news as an outright filthy sinner, he gets in. But the squeaky clean guy who's in, he moves out. It's a total reversal, but both sons in the parable are lost. Here's how we approach this. We're going to do a very, very, very traditional approach to this part of the text, which is verse by verse, phrase by phrase. It's almost typed word for word for you on your outline in sequence, because I know we're dealing with different, you know, translations. So we're, do, we're and we're going to make comments as we go on every phrase and every verse. We're all going to bring together, you know, what God is, you know, speaking to us about, about tiny little portions of it. So this is very traditional Bible study, just going phrase by phrase and verse by verse. There is no parallel to this parable in the rest of the Gospels. This is it. Aren't you glad that God put it on Luke to investigate thoroughly because Matthew and Mark did not record this. So we would not have this, by the way, next week has got another one. We would not have if God didn't use Luke to record it. Now the word prodigal, which we all grew up with is a word that comes from the Vulgate, which is the Latin translation of the Bible that Jerome did in 382 AD. That's where the word comes from. The text does not use the word Vulgate. It was a word, you know, just like the NIV puts a title over the section. That's what the Vulgate do. They already were making titles. It's not a part of the biblical text. That's where the word prodigal comes from. It does not come from the text. 
Does everybody get that? So church tradition has kept the word prodigal. That's how we know this guy. But we should be talking about two lost sons, not just the one guy who is the dirty, filthy, rotten sinner guy. I mean, the guy, you know, it's like, man, didn't you know any better than, you know, to waste all your money on this gal and that gal and this, you know, pipe and that pipe and this drink and that drink, you know, didn't you know any better? That's easy, you know, to, to throw a stone at him. But it's the squeaky clean guy at home, of course, that, you know, gets the close of the parable. So here we go. There are three characters in the parable. There's a younger son. He's equivalent to which group of people in the opening introduction of the chapter? The tax collectors and sinners. This is on purpose. Jesus introduced the whole parable thing to show us the picture of what this looks like. The younger son is the picture of the tax collectors and sinners. Now you understand why at the end of the parable, they're the ones who are attracted to Jesus. The older son is a picture of whom? Pharisees. Now you understand why they are outside of the feast at the end of the parable. Because they're not attracted to Jesus because they're, what problem do they have? They don't know they're sinners. They're blind to their sin. They're perfect. They're righteous. They've never done anything wrong, the son says to the father. I've slaved for you my whole life. I've dotted every I and crossed every T. You owe me. They're on the outside. Do you see how the text masterfully you know, brings this picture, and it's like, oh, God, put a mirror in front of my face. Who am I acting like? See, the self-righteous insider or the profligate outsider? And we're all hoping, isn't there a third category? (laughs) All right. Then the third, of course, in the parable is the father, which is a picture of God. So both sons show us, listen carefully, both sons show us how to be alienated from God. This is important. I'm not sure I grew up with this understanding of the text. Both sons show us how to be alienated from God. The one becomes alienated from God by just diving right into sin and loving it instead of God. The other son is self-righteous. He's trying to, oh, could could somebody grab the door, please? He's trying to do everything God wants him to do, but he doesn't need a savior. The inside son doesn't need a savior because he's his own savior. He's doing everything perfectly. You see? So both sons show how to be alienated from God. The older by being religious, the younger by being irreligious. That's what we have before us. The center of the parable is the father's reaction to the two lost sons. That's the center of the parable. The father's reaction to two lost sons. I divided this up into acts and scenes, but please, folks, don't let that make you think that this is a Shakespearean play. That doesn't have any truth. Be careful. You know, I realize after I did this act one, scene one, scene two, scene three, if we if we lose the truth of this text, you know, then then we're in trouble. So here we go. We're going to go phrase by phrase, verse by verse, verse 12. So the younger son approaches the father in verse 12 and says to the father, give me my share of the estate. This is unheard of. What is the son thinking about the father when he says this statement? Give me my share of the estate. I wish my father was dead. I I so want to be away from you in your home. I don't want anything to do with you. Do you see how irreligious people respond to God? Just give me what I'm due, and I'm out of here. He wishes his father were dead already because the estate is never divvied up while the father is. Okay. 
So this is unheard of. In Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, the younger son would get one third of the father's estate because the older son in Jewish law was granted double portion. So the older son gets two thirds. This comes into play into the text. You can't miss these things. The younger son gets one third. How does he get the third? And how does he walk away with it? Did he go to the Jewish bank of whatever? How did he get the third? This is not monetary money. What is the father's asset? See, this is what we don't think. There it is. He has to sell land and property. How does that make the father feel? He doesn't have money in a bank. There's no Jewish banks in this day. He has to sell land that has been in the family passed on to him because he liquidates it so the son can walk away with some cash in his pocket. How do you think he paid for the fund that he had in Sin City? He had cash at that point, but the father liquidates this. The son is acting as his own God, and he doesn't care about delayed gratification. Do you know people who act that way? I want what I want now, and I'm not going to wait. I think we've all had that sin in our lives at some point in time. I want it now. Folks, not to hit below the belt, but your wallet or your purse is below the belt. Check yourself, brothers and sisters. If you've got credit card debt, you, you are pretty much like the son who squandered everything away. And we'll do a good sense budget course at some point, you know, really soon again. But believers, you know, who are in credit card debt in particular versus home debt or something like that. It's like, boy, let, let's, let's not act like this guy then who took the father's wealth and just wasted it. And now we're broke. The father willingly and graciously, verse 12, divided his property Read it carefully. Read it carefully. There it is. Between them. So the father, in some sense, has then deeded the other two-thirds of his property to the older son. The father, right now, has nothing. Does everybody get that? Them. So he he deeded the rest to the son. The older son has the rest of the estate. While the younger got his in cash somehow liquidated so he could walk off with it and take off. Here we go. In fact, you'll be surprised in verse 12 that uh, he divided the property between them. This is the Greek word property, the Greek word bios, from which you hear the English word Bio, biology, the word bio, anybody? Life. Life. He divided his life with the sons. Jesus did not pick a word that dealt with consumer products. He divided their, his property. See, the English word property to us means something tangible. He's dividing his life. He's giving his life away. It's in the word property in the Greek text. It's the word bios. The father divided his life with his sons. Let's see what the sons do with the father's life. Okay. Sometimes my application here, keep in mind, God does let sinners go their own way sometimes, right? Did any of you have um, a prodigal chapter of your life? Did any of you take the money and run? Just, just one chapter? <laughs> Sometimes God lets sinners go their own way, by their own choice. He lets them go. Romans 1, in your notes, Hosea, uh, Hosea 2. I'm back to Hosea. Boy, that was the best blessing when somebody said, let's do Hosea. I never wanted to do Hosea. Some of you said, let's do Hosea. Hosea 2, I learned that sometimes when the prodigal wife, a Gomer, remember, she went off into prostitution, God will put a hedge 
in front of her, behind her, to the left or the right, so she can't find the prostitute's house. Sometimes God will do that. He'll keep the sinner from going off into worse circumstances. Sometimes, Hosea 2, verse 14, God will speak to her heart. The Greek doesn't bring that out. It says he'll allure her. That's almost unfortunate because sometimes alluring sounds sinful to us. The the Hebrew, I'm sorry, says he's going to speak to her. Sometimes God will speak to the heart of a sinner and turn them from going over a cliff. But sometimes in this parable, he lets him go. He lets him go. That's the providence of God. I don't understand that. Some of us wouldn't be in this room if God just let us go. We wouldn't be here. We would not have recovered. <laughs> right? So let's go to scene number two, verse 13. Here's sin's path. Look at the verbs. Verse 13. He got together everything he had. He set off to a distant country. He squandered it in wild living. That's the phrase that gives us the word prodigal. In wild living. I mean, there was no end to sin and the indulgence of it. He wasted his life is what the the verse is saying. So why did he go off to a distant country, brothers and sisters? wanted to hide his sin. He didn't want his family or whoever knew him to know it. Doesn't that sound like certain seasons of my own life? I want to hide yeah. my sin. I don't want other people to see what I'm doing. So I'm going to go off a but long I'm way. Do it. But I'm going to do it. Because this is the way I can do it in my own conscience to be free and safe. Verse 14. He spent everything. And then... There's a severe famine which comes, and he ends up in need. Folks, this to me is powerful. Sometimes my my choices get me into bad times and hard times, right? This guy made his own free choices and got himself into really hard times. And then sometimes our hard times are complicated by divine providence one more time. How did the famine come to that country? God put it there. And what type of a famine was it? Severe. Severe. It was not just a mediocre little famine. It was severe. This is God's hedge in this text for this boy. His providence makes a famine happen right in the place where the boy has run to. And this is interesting to me because the verb that he was in need, verse 14, is the same verb that that Paul uses in Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and are in need of the glory of God. That's what Romans 3, 23 says. The the fallen short has always made me a little nervous because people I'm not that far from God. It's only a short fall. That's why, you know, I'm nervous. But this is the first time I've seen it's the same verb in verse 14. It's the same verb here. All are in need of the glory of God. We don't have his glory. And that's why we need Christ. You see how the gospel is going to come into this. You know, we understand that. Right. So verse 15 he at least is prudent enough that he does what? Which right now, everybody goes to the county office to get, you know, government money or, you know, some stamp or something like that. This guy is at least prudent enough to to be hired out. And the job he's hired out to is? How does that work for a young Jewish boy? This is the worst of the worst. Okay. He is unclean from his prostitution, and now he's unclean in his Jewish heritage because he's most likely working for a Gentile man on a Gentile farm. Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with what? And this phrase I've wondered for years, 
<laughs> and no one gave him anything. Well, why doesn't he just eat the pig food? That part to me is unique. No one gave it to him. I think it's highlighting the fact of God has put this sinner in the worst place where there is nothing of any support anywhere. No one would give him anything. So it, it, it puts it on the people of the community. Well, there always oh, is somebody nice in the community somewhere, isn't there? Yeah, you know, and, and God has hedged him into this point that he won't let anybody even give him. And, and whatever these pods, it says it's pods from a tree, you know, which would be an arid desert type tree. These are pods and there have been beans in them. This is what the pigs are eating. And maybe he tried one and choked on it. It was so dry and he's got nothing else. So why, you know, his, whether it's a conscience issue, but I, I just tend to see God is at work in this point, but he's all alone, right? And this is the crash and burn that the guy is experiencing. So let's go then to scene three. Scene three. Verse 17 also bewilders me a little bit. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said to himself, you know, my father's hired men, they have food to spare. Would somebody explain to me how he came to his senses? Explain that. His eyes were open. See, I don't know any other answer from the text because the text doesn't explain the question, you know, except that God, again, in divine providence. Takes you to the lowest of the low when you can't. The next step for him was death. Sure. Yeah. By suicide or just by initiation. Yeah. Please. I was thinking of spiritual senses. His spiritual life yeah. were open. It, it, it could be. Now, personally, I think we've all you know, looked at this text enough times. Many folks say this is the moment of, of conversion also for him. This is a moment of conversion. Because come to your, I mean, you know, if we, if we just limit verse 17 to his rational capability, I think we've robbed and drained the Holy Scripture you know, of God's power in it, you know, so, oh, yeah, it's all, sin is all rational and you just make the right choice then to not do it anymore. Well, I know a whole lot of people for which it's not rational anymore and they can't stop. So, so it works rationally for some sinners, but not for others. You see, that's why I'm, I'm not convinced this is what the text is in, implying. Yeah, the next verse is going to tell us, Father, that I have sinned Correct. against you. This is a conversion moment. So scripture would indicate to us, and I give you 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. God made his light shine in this dark boy's heart. This is what the rest of the scripture explains for me. I am taking that verse, and, and for me, it helps to understand he came to his senses. If he did this all on his own, well, then there's no need for God at this point either, you see. But the rest of the, the, rest of the text in the verse would, would tell us. You know, God is doing this. And part of me also understands Roman 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness which leads us to. So there's something of the providence of God which is working a kindness that this guy would consider. Yeah, my father, I, I, I hate him. I want him dead. But wait a minute. Maybe he's not, dear old dad isn't so bad after all. I mean, the, the hired men get food. Wait a minute. See, God's kindness is part of the factor in him coming to his senses and leading him to repentance. In fact, in Hosea 2, verse 7, even Gomer herself said, I'm quoting, I will go back to my husband as at first, for then I was better off than now. God does that graciously somehow turning a sinner from, from the magnetism to sin. And, fr and frees us so that there can be a, a U-turn. There's mystery in here. There's more mystery than I can explain, correct? In this, I praise God for that. But, but that's why we can't miss 
God as the seeking shepherd who is doing all kinds of work as we as a church are trying to present Christ to a lost community. God is working uh, in, in powerful ways. Now, the hired men, you should know this phrase is interesting. These hired men are not the regular doulas servants of the farm of the father. These hired men are second in line. These are skilled tradesmen or day laborers who would have come from the village. The servants, doulas, those are the ones who take care of the house. They live in the house. They take care of, you know, the food and clothing and everything else. So he wants to be like his, he, he'd like to be an apprentice. So this son considers himself, I, I'm not going to ask dad to be a son. I'm not going to ask dad to be a servant. I'm not going to ask my dad to be a hired man. I'll be grateful if you'll take me as third in the totem pole. I think that shows me a certain amount of conversion humility. He's not going to assert what is not his, but hold on to that while I say that sentence. There's something really powerful coming. Verse 18, he makes a plan. I'm going to set out. I'm going to go back and I'm going to say, and you know, sometimes I need to speak out loud to myself the same way this son did. Why? Why do I actually need to do this? To solidify it, to plant it. Because the power of my sinful flesh, if I wait, if I just speak it in my head, if I wait, sometimes the power of my, by the next morning, ah, I, won't, I don't need to do that. My sinful flesh can talk me out of the plan that the spirit of God is working in, in my sinful mind. So the son's plan is here. He, he wants to present himself with humility before his father. Verse 18, he's going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. This, this is repentance. This is what you turns to look like. He understands that all sin is against the holiness of God. And the word holy isn't in the text. But he's sinned against heaven. And heaven is all that is holy, right? And Sin, I think 99.9% of the time is always an offense against someone else. The horizontal thing. Sin is always, you know, my offense against you. It's always sin is vertical and sin is horizontal. It always is. I mean, I, I just, you know, you can think of maybe of sins when you sin by yourself, <laughs> I guess. Um, but this, this, he understands repentance and he understands sin in this case verse 19 he says i'm no longer worthy to be called your son this is his plan i'm no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired men and a, uh, an apprentice to the hired man the third guy on the totem pole and what catches me about verse 19 is the lies that sin brings me to believe he's disqualified himself for being a son correct he's disqualified himself uh, you know, for being bringing a son, but we're going to learn, of course, something very powerful about the father and the relationship <laughs> that the father sees about the son. So, um, scene four, letter D, he got up and he went to his father. He executed his plan, right? His repentance returns uh, himself to the one who's offended. See, he, I mean, he could, he could stay in Pittsville, poor and broken penniless and confesses sin, you know, out with the pigs to God. And he knew that wasn't the end of it. That doesn't resolve his sin. You see, he's got to go back to the one he's offended. He's got to go back to his father. Verse 20. So, um, so while now he, here's, here's the butt of verse 20. Here's where the gospel just overwhelms us. Doesn't it? The gospel verse 20, while he was still a long way off, while he's still a long, how far can you see down the road? If your road was level, I mean, you know. And if you were paying attention. You, you see, I, th that's where this gospel thing is in here. The father, I'm not sure he can exactly make out if this is a deer or a, a son. But he's that far off and he's attentive. The father is attentive. He's always been looking for the first parable. He's looking down there. He's working here. He's looking down there. That, that's why this distance issue. You know what? 
it, <laughs> what what we're what I maybe am so poor at is right is is the um, thing of well yeah I'm embarrassed I've sinned uh, I'm no good let me just stay in the corner you know by myself and you know and maybe it'll get better that kind of you know uh, yeah yeah well nobody hire me anyway but that sense of um, uh, you just you know if I stay by myself then maybe I won't hurt anybody else again you know this kind of shame thank you that sense of shame uh, kind of a thing but here the father is anticipating the son's return that's what we get out of um, yes yes but don't forget the hope in God's world, it drives him to seek the sheep. See, that's what I think what we forget. He's so actively, you know, he's so actively moving wherever that lost son is anyway, right? And putting the hedges and, you know, putting the blockades there and denying him access to the community's food bank, right? You know, or the food share card, right? God is there. He, he isn't just in the passive way of being the nice God back at home. Him yes, back. that's helpful. The, the verb that you just used. So that's there. And the father, verse 20, he saw his son. Finally, it was, it was close enough. Yep. This is my son. Right. And he's filled with compassion, filled with compassion. He ran to his son he throws his arms around his son and he kisses his son. Why does he do all of this? Why does he do all of this? Okay. Folks, here is the core and the center of what God is all about. This, this is what made Jesus attractive to tax collectors and sinners. This power of the gospel and God's love for a lost world that sends his only son is what will make sinners in our communities attractive. Not not to a building, you understand the point, but to the people who are God's people, a part of this building called church, right? The father who runs after profligate boys and girls and men and women, he runs after them. This, brothers and sisters, is the initiating grace of God. What has the son not done yet? He hasn't. It isn't your repentance which makes God love you. It's not your repentance. God is not like this waiting for you to fess up and and simmer down and knock your pride off he's waiting for you to get your act together i oh i i I think we just hear that too much right get your act together and then maybe god will you know bless you yes look at this the son hasn't said a thing I mean, in this sense, yeah, God, God knew what the son was going to do. He spoke the parable. He wrote the parable. But in, 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 the, in the flesh of it, the father didn't know that the son was going to say anything. He might have just wanted to come back and say, hey, dad, I think you, you shorted me on the third. I, it's the initiating grace of God. So he ran, the father runs. I mean, oh, the grace of God, oh, the glory of God. He threw his arms around his son. No Middle Eastern father would respond this way to a wayward son. No Pharisee, you understand, you get the point, would respond this way to a wayward son. This is contrary to the culture that a father would run after this profligate son, before the son has even made it to the, to, to the farm lane, you see? I mean, all these verbs. The compassion word, Jesus has used this multiple times in Luke. Remember, Christ met uh, the widow's son from Nan. He was being carried on the funeral board, and, and Christ had compassion for the widow because her only son, her only me, saint. Same verb there in Psalm 103, verse 13, which we all know in your notes, as a father 
has compassion on his children. Can you say it with me? So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Psalm 103, you know, we use that one, right? He fell on the neck of his son. Uh, the Greek indicates he, you know, uh, hugged him, you know, it was pretty small. He fell on his neck. He kissed him. What does the kiss say? The father's kiss of his, on his son. What does that say? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And, and relationships. See, all these actions are already indicating what the son thought he, he disqualified himself for, right? What the son thought was not possible. What the son, you know, thought, you know, not in my wildest dream could I ever be restored. Make me like an apprentice to the day laborer who only gets hired on your farm once in a while. And maybe then, maybe once every two weeks, I might get enough to have some food, right? The father is indicating, of course, the relationship already, the family love. So verse 21, um, the son comes and says to his father, I've sinned against heaven. And I've sinned against you. Is that word for word? Just like he, he had already thought in his heart and his mind. Um, I am no longer worthy uh, to be called your son. What's missing in verse 21? From what he planned to say. <laughs> Why doesn't he say that? We sense that the father in verse 22 has cut him off. He won't even let his son believe the lie that I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father won't let him say it because it's not true. It's not true. So we sense he cuts his son off. Because the father says, quick, verse 22, quick. (laughs) See, the son's probably a little startled, right? We've got to make something immediately happen here. Verse 22, bring the best robe and put put it on him. Whose robe is the best robe in the house? It's the father's robe. What does it say if the father puts his robe on his filthy, dirty son who probably has very little as far as rags on him at this point. What is it saying? What is the word? You're my son. And that's never changed. You're part of my family. You have my robe on. We we can think of all the, the teachings Paul did, you know, with robes of righteousness and the picture of covering Don't forget what God did in the garden. What did he do in the garden to sinners who had run and hid because they wanted to be as far away from the one they had offended? What did God do? Yeah. And before he did that, he actually killed the animal. Yeah. He had to slay an animal. So the prefiguring of, you know, the death of Christ. But he, he calls out, you know, Adam. See, you know, I I know there's somebody coming way over, you know. Where are you? Right? I mean, but he's he's reaching out, right, in that way. The father's robe is covering the, the naked shame of his son. The, the You know, righteousness as a covering. It's a robe of righteousness. Christ won for us. It's a restored family relationship, right? And it can't be earned, can it? Has the son done anything to earn the robe, <laughs> folks? But But we live in such a polished, religious works righteousness world and churches are the best sometimes at it churches are the best at you know you you know if you do the right thing if you obey the right commandments god will love you churches can be the best at teaching works righteousness Get your life together, for heaven's sakes. You're an embarrassment to your parents in this community. (laughs) There's no gospel in there anywhere. None. Right? It's just shame and law. Well, that's that's why nobody was attracted to the Pharisees. Nobody was going after them. But all 
of the sinners and tax collectors, verse one, all of them, they're flocking to Jesus, flocking to him. I mean, if Christ was into building churches, he would have had satellite churches all over Israel because they couldn't have put them all in one tent, right? They're flocking because the power, the power of the gospel, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for Jews and then those, those dirty Gentiles. <laughs> right? It can't be earned. Verse 22, he puts a ring on his son's finger. What is this saying? Probably the signet ring. It probably is. What, what, which means what? What does that mean? Remind us. Was, they, they use that to seal things. And what did it mean? Uh, authority, yeah. authority. Authority. Yeah, uh, th- th- this is a family position of authority. Yes, it, it probably was that kind of thing for deeds and documents, the, the ring, you know, as we learn, right? So he, he has a restored relationship in this family and in this home that he has a ring on his finger and he can participate in, in the family business and carry out transactions and, you know, with people position, position right. Which, which, you know, has tons of doctrinal uh, overtone to it. You know, the position that, that Christ gives us, right. The family seal. I, I think of it too. What about the third thing? Sandals on his feet. What, what is that saying? Service didn't wear sandals usually. No. And, and I, you know, our guess is as far as he went, you know, he wore out his pair, you know, on the way to sin. Maybe he left them behind in, in so-and-so's bungalow. Or maybe just the work in the field with the pigs. It was enough. You know, I, I, I think he came home sandalless. I, I think he did. I Maybe it's a guess. Sell them so he could get some food. Maybe he did that, you know, in the background of the text, which, you know, when we don't have verses, but put sandals on his feet, you know, I mean, just the, the tenderness of the father, the care of the father, the detail of the father, you know, restored. The, the restoration of the son here, you know, and this, see, all these things, I see, I want to stop on everything because it helps me understand the first parable of the lost sheep that the shepherd is going after that sheep. And when he finds the sheep, what does he all do with the sheep again? What? Yeah. And, you know, if, if it had some wounds, you know, he would have taken care of that sheep and its wounds. I mean, he carries that sheep home. Uh, Isaiah used that picture, by the way, in chapter 40, that the shepherd. Draped on his neck again, just like we said, that the father draped himself. Yeah. The neck. Yes. Draped. Yes. The, the, Yeah. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? So barefoot and destitute, the son comes home, but he's restart, restored. And there's just a lavishness to the grace. I, I thought to myself, too, a ring, sandals, the best robe, right? Just the lavishness of God's grace. And up to this point in time, the father hasn't said, we need to clear the air first, son. No conditions. Right. The son knows he knew, needs to do that, but the father hasn't said, sit down here on the front porch. We, we've got some things we got to deal with. Right. The father doesn't do that. So verse 23, we get to the next part. See, bring the fatted calf. We're going we're gonna to feast and we're going to celebrate. Okay, now when in Jewish culture did people eat fatted calves? Yes, big celebrations. When important guests would come, because like Abraham, they went out and thrust, you know, and, Yep. You right. You couldn't just go down to the supermarket and buy a No, steak. So no. That's what they had to do. They had to make the bread and whatever. Yes, and, and we, we all remember from the, uh, the parable of the... Um, the, you know, the, the wedding, wedding banquet and, you know, with no refrigeration, the preparation of stuff had to be so planned and carried out, you know, so carefully because, you know, I mean, if you make the, you know, the goat, the sheep, the calf or whatever, you know, that day, you got to serve it that day. 
You, you couldn't put it in a Nesco tomorrow. Did the priests and the Levites also eat it when they would sacrifice? Um, it, in, interesting. You're, you're, you're pretty close to the whole thing here. Uh, major religious festivals in Israel, like the Day of Atonement, is when a fatted calf would have been. So the, the fellowship meal that the priests and others you know, would have enjoyed, it was rare. You understand beef. I mean, beef and chicken and everything else. They just never had it. They did not have that in their diet. The fatted calf, this is a rare, rare celebration. And it's large. See, this is not the goat. The son will talk about the goat. And the goat was cheap, um, you know, to get a goat and have that, you know, with a couple of buddies. You know, we'd nod on all his bones and, and we still would have been hungry with a goat. But the fatted calf, does everybody get that? The fatted calf was raised specifically for a religious festival like the Day of Atonement or something like that. This is the whole village because it wasn't the household, you know, slaves. It wasn't the hired men. They wouldn't have eaten the whole fatted calf. The whole village is coming in. The and, calf probably would have been veal rather than beef. Okay. That, yeah. Veal. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Do we, does anybody eat that anymore? Yeah. Do you? I don't have any good veal dishes. <laughs> it's hard to find. It. Well, it's more expensive to pay for. Yeah. Right. And it's expensive, right? So verse 24, why should we do all of this? Verse 24, it just makes me want to weep for this son of mine, this son of mine. Just look at it. Enjoy th this lavish grace, this son of mine. It's not this jerk of mine, this foolish son of mine, this idiot Son of mine, this, oh, the, the, the glory of, of those particular words, right? This is the reason for the celebration. This son of mine, I think of all the verses where, you know, Scripture, Paul, Galatians 3.26, we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You know, many others, Paul uses that sonship. We have been adopted, right, as sons um, which is, you know, part of the Jewish thing. That's not a gender thing. We don't have to change our Bibles to be gender neutral. We don't have to do that, folks. It's heirs. It's heirs. Yeah, right. So the reason for the celebration, verse 24, just look at the, the doctrine that is in the Father's words. This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found. We understand that the Father's work much of which, you know, yes, I've, as best as I understand scripture, I've tried to give words to what the father has been doing, right? The, to what the shepherd has been doing. Um, but here we, we see this powerful thing of the son who is repenting and turning back, the father who is drawing the son back. And the, the, the concept of the picture of repentance is a picture of a resurrection, He's alive again. It's a picture. Repentance is a biblical picture of resurrection. He was dead. What passage in our transgressions and sins? What passage? Anybody? You were there. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. And then, but God in his mercy made you alive. Oh, glory. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. The wages of your sin is death. death. But the gift of God, the gift. Oh, maybe if I grovel a little bit, God will welcome me back. Has nothing to do with that, right? And, and I think maybe, maybe we're putting law expectations upon people. That's why sinners aren't attracted to churches. We're, we're wanting them to clean up their life first. You know, I, I don't know. I just, the text makes me, you know, ask and look and evaluate it, everything, you know, I do. And, you know, I, I think it invites all of us to do that as well too. Romans 5 verse 12, sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, right? God said to Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of it, you shall, 
right? See, we, we understand these doctrinal things, the wages of sin, dead, but God reverses death. This is the gospel. God reverses death. He reverses dead people. He makes dead people alive. That's the picture, the picture of, of, of conversion, God makes dead people alive. All of us were dead spiritually to God. He made us alive. Before you came and, and did your holy works, he made you alive. Before we, we rightly repented and confessed, he made us alive. Um, this, this, where sin increased, yes. Increases, you can't God's you, grace. No, you can't outsin God's grace. For whatever sinners out there who thinks I can never be welcomed into a church. Never. Sinners and tax collectors were thronging to Jesus. That is just so cool. Right? And I'm going, God, well, you know, Paul did talk about the aroma. You know, we, we do have a scent around us. Churches and people have a scent around them. It's either the scent of life or it's the scent of death so i'm afraid maybe i'm stinking too much like death in my own community maybe um so you know it it, it's good for us to think through all these things right so god's love and his grace it it can pardon and restore the worst sinner is that true God's love and grace, it can pardon and restore the worst sinner. There is full and free acceptance. The Father shows us that. He shows us that, right? And he who was on the outside is now fully on the inside. He who was on the outside is now fully on the inside. And that's God's grace in his work. That's God's work. He brings outsiders into his family, (laughs) And now this, the scene is going to change. We're going to go to act two because now we have to deal with the son who is inside and now is going to stay outside. The, the reversal, the both sons are lost. Does everybody get that now? I think we've tended to preach typically only on the sinful son. But this guy is as lost as his brother. And here we go. Act two, letter E, act two, scene one. Meanwhile, the older son is in the field, right? The shift in focus in the parable. The, the, this is the picture then again of whom? The older son is the picture of whom from verse one and two? Okay, you get it. People who are religious, people who are self-righteous. Working. People, yes, working to to. Uh, make themselves look good to God. That's here's the problem with his son. He came, he finishes work. He comes verse 25. He comes near the house. He heard music and it dancing, right? He doesn't know the reason for the music and the dancing. So verse 26, he asked a servant. See, now here's the term for the first level of people in the father's house, the servant. Then there's the hired men. Those are the second And the younger son wanted to be the apprentice. He'd be the third. So he asked a servant about the music and dancing. Verse 27, your brother has come home. And the father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound, right? He has him back safe and sound. Letter F, act two, scene two, the curtain comes up. (laughs) I mean, it just helps us divide the scripture in a nice way. That's all. This is not Shakespeare. It is truth. Verse 28. The older brother becomes angry and refuses to go in. What is he angry about? Now, process this. What is he angry about? Okay. Number one, this a jealousy and the fact that this no good rotten guy who swindled what you know dishonored his father by wishing him dead and taking the third of the estate right what else what more is he here for what more is he here for yes he's come back 
don't think he's getting any of mine in here. To- what else do I stand to lose now? Because we've got two thirds of the estate left. And if the younger brother is back in the family, does he get another third someday? Does everybody see this unfolding? Well, go, go ahead and call it more of, yeah, of what it is to see. He's angry because he's getting ripped off. And guess who he's going to blame? He's going to blame his father. Because you didn't treat me better the way I deserve. Okay. Meanwhile, the older son comes in. We got that. And we found out about the servant. So he's angry, right? Um, and, and, and now he refuses to go in verse 28. He refuses to go in. And I want to make sure we see that part of verse 28. This is the same verb that Jesus used in uh, two chapters ago, Luke 13, 34, where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and wants to gather them as chicks under his wings. But you were not willing. It's the same verb. He was not willing to go in. He refused to go in. Here's the Pharisees. They don't want anything to do with Jesus and him being savior. They want to be their own savior. They want to be their own. So this same verb pops up here. So the father, verse 28, I mean, this makes me weep as much as the father looking down the lane to see my son. Is that him? Verse 28, the father does what? Spatially speaking. Verse 28, he went out. Folks, do you see this grace? I mean, the grace that's poured on the younger son and now the grace of the father. He goes out to his pouting, angry, older son. He goes out and he pleads with him. And this Greek verb is one of those as well, too, which wasn't a one time son. Please come in. This is the repetitive action of the father's grace. Please Come in, come in, come in. The father is pleading. It's a repetitious verb. It's a verb where he keeps doing this. This is love. This is grace for those who have put their feet down. This is grace for ones who are mad at God because he hasn't blessed or done something, right? So this is what, you know, I say that important theological term of the condescension of God. It doesn't mean God is looking down his nose at the older son. It means the father will become a servant to his older son. He will go out to his older son. He's showing the same lavish grace. And verse 29, but the son answered his father, look. What does that say? The older son to the father, verse 29. What is that saying? Disrespect. It is. Absolutely. Look. Look. Listen to me. See, I mean, we understand the younger son's disrespect. He hated his father. He wanted him dead. Well, look at this guy's. Look, he doesn't even call him dad. (laughs) Father, just you. Oh, this. Oh, no respect for it's demeaning. It's demeaning. Well, his both sons demean the father. Well, what does any sin do to God (laughs) in his glory and in his holiness? We are all, you know, we want to put God in a tiny little box. All these years, verse 29, I've been slaving for you. What is that saying about him? All these years, I've been slaving for you. Verse 29. What's it saying? What is he uh, confirming himself up? (laughs) Does everything right. I do it all right, and my foolish brother has done everything wrong all these years, right? Slaving this joyless compliance. Love God above all things, okay? 
love my parents. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. See, the, complying and doing d- compliance. Yes. Toward Just yes. He views his father as a taskmaster. And if I do the right things, you'll like me. And then give me a, a, a favor. If I do the right, see a works righteous thing is all over this older son. If I just obey the laws, I'll get blessed by God. He is his own savior. He, he doesn't need Jesus or God as a savior. He is his own. See, I've done it all right. Well, when you're not a sinner, you don't need a savior. <laughs> Self-righteous people don't need Jesus. They, never even got to go. Yeah. So see, that's where we're going. He's resentful of his father, and he believes his father owes him. God, you owe me. I've lived like a good Christian boy my whole life. You owe me for that. And God owes us nothing. Nothing. But hear this older son, verse 29. I never disobeyed your orders. Do you see the the sin problem of the older son now? It is. He, he's blind to his own sin. He, he's a self-righteous person. The whole of scripture deals with this issue. See, that is the sin problem, self-righteousness. He did the outward right thing, but his heart was really messed up. Yep. Yeah. His sin is pride in his religious works, and all religious works will send you to hell. All good boy Christians and good girl Christians who are disconnected from God's grace, we, we all end up in hell apart from Christ, right? Self-righteousness. He, he presents a moral superiority, right? I am better than my father and I'm better than my son. And then you never even gave me a goat to celebrate with my friends. Yeah. See, a goat, you don't get a whole lot of meat off of a goat in the first place. I mean, you owe me, dad, and you never even blessed me in this whole Endeavor. I've served, I've slaved, I've sweated, and I've done it all right. I've done it all correctly, the way you said to do it. You owe me. And I'm waiting for the father to clobber it because that's what my flesh wants to do. Right? He's accusing his father. He views his father as a selfish and an ungrateful man, right? You never gave me a goat. He has no concept of his father's love for him. None. Do you see? There's an absolute disconnect. The father goes out to his son, but the son has zero connection to the father's love. He's blind to it. That's the best I can say. He doesn't get it. He just doesn't see it because he's his own God, right? Verse 30. But when this son of yours, this is interesting because the Greek does not use the noun son. It says, when this one of yours, when this one of yours, he's pointing or he's referring to his younger brother. When this one of yours, what's the older brother saying? No connection. None. Not no, because I've written him off. I mean, I don't want anything to do with sinners. They're the ones that go to hell. This this is the Pharisee. Do you see how God helps us to understand in the robes of a Pharisee how this comes out and works? See? And it's this son of your, he's your problem, Dad, because you're the one who originally cashed in the land and gave it away. Well, what father in his right mind would do that? See, this is the son. Yeah. Get the book. Get the book. What's the name of it? The Prodigal God. Is it in the library? Uh, I think I've got a couple copies. Yeah. 
So here we got to finish because we're running. Oh, yeah, we're running out. You never gave a goat. But when this son of this contempt picture and he squandered verse 30, he squandered everything. Uh, the, the whole remember the life he squandered your life, your bios. He squandered that on prostitutes. And of course, you know what they do, do with people caught in prostitution in the Old Testament. What do you do with them? So, yeah, that's what I want for this son. Stone him. That, you know, let's just apply the law to every sinner and say, this is what you get. You don't get any grace whatsoever. Let's get rid of him, right? Well, here's here's how the the whole thing closes with scene number three, right? It's the closing scene, verse 31. The father at this point, right? Any human father might have been ready to deck him. True. But look at how God responds to the contemptible, arrogant sinner that I am. Look at how he responds. My son, my son. He doesn't demean his his son. He doesn't chide his son at this point. He wants his son on the inside. He speaks now to his son's concerns, and then he'll also address his concerns for his brother, right? He's going to address both things. He speaks tenderly without a harsh rebuke. He pleads to his heart. Yep. Verse 31, you are always with me. And the son never connected to the father's love. This passage appears in the Old Testament to the psalmist who uses the same thing. God, I am always with you. I'm never apart from your blessing. The son did not know how to apply the father's blessing to him at any point. That shows a religious person who's detached from God. He does not know how to apply the infinite blessing of God in a day-to-day walk. That's what tells you you got a religious Pharisee on your hands. You are always with me. So the father's blessing was never separated from the son. Verse 31. Everything I have is yours, which in this case was literally true as best as we understand. Because when he cashed in a third of the estate, the other two thirds were deeded. Oh, the older son owns it all. A couple of chapters ago, Jesus says the father is pleased to give you the kingdom you own it all the son's inheritance is in contrast in verse 29 when he said to his father you never gave me anything the son does not know how to appropriate the blessing of the father in his life he's got it all and he doesn't even know it The son has never been lacking. It's our failure to apply the blessing of God to our lives. Verse 32, the father says it's a necessity. We had to celebrate and be glad. It's a divine necessity. This is what marks God most in the scripture and in the world. He celebrates sinners who are brought back. Repentance is what delight God's heart because this brother of yours was dead and now he's alive. Remember the uh, repentance uh, whole process of conversion, a picture of resurrection. So the relationship of the brothers is still intact, whether he recognizes it or not, right? The question is, will the older brother repent? That's where the text ends. Will he repent? And will he come back into the festival with the father? The answer is, no. we're left to apply it Will we invite sinners to come to know the graciousness of the Father? Will we do that? I just want to state that the prodigal son and the older son, I have that in my flesh. I recognize that there at times, you know, when it's another story in the town. We all have that. Yep. Yep. So who should have searched? For the lost son. Remember I said I, we have to end with that? Who should have searched? Because remember, this parable is lacking one of the five elements that the others two have. Nobody is searching in this parable. Who should have, now that you know the end, the end of the story? No, no, no. The older 
Yes. Yes. The older brother had all the means and the resources. He had the whole estate. Everything I have is yours. He was the one. This is a parable then, which teaches us the failure, the failure of the older brother who has all the means, but he was not going to go after sinners. This is teaching the failure of religion and Pharisaism and the religious people in Jesus' day, because nobody's going to them because they are not going to the sinners. And this is the crux of churches today. Will we, who have it all, will we go after lost sinners? If we sit in these doors and wait for them to maybe like our sign or what's written out there, we're missing the entire point. See? So the gospel teaches, though, as I close, thanks for the extra time, there is a true older son. This son is not the son that we pattern our lives after because we don't know if he ever repented and came into the family again. He's on the outside, right? There's a true older son. The gospel teaches that Christ himself is the true older brother who acted selflessly and went out to search for the lost son, you and me. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save Those who are lost, that's us. The older brother, Christ, who is our brother, he came to seek us. Because in this story, the religious people aren't seeking anybody. Do do you see how the gospel comes into play here? And it was costly. Yes, the older brother would have had to cash in some of the estate to look for the son, his brother, right? It would have cost him. Right. And he would have had to hire somebody for the farm. And all of a sudden he's thinking of himself. I'm going to lose. I'm not going after my brother. He deserves what he got. And Jesus says, right. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The cost of the older brother was his entire life for you to win you to himself, right? The cost. Yeah, it would have cost the older son, but the older son is not who we model after. It's Jesus Christ, right? And and so 2 Corinthians 5, and I'll close verse 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. The Father does not count our sins against us. This is the gospel. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Will we go out? Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for leading us through a marvelous text that we, we, we've all been familiar with this precious gospel of Luke 15. For many of us, perhaps it was our conversion moment. We just thank you for again opening our eyes to see how marvelous your grace is, oh God. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being the God who goes out to seek the lost sheep. Thank you for being the one who who divinely worked in, yes, mysterious and hidden ways. You divinely worked to bring me to yourself. You divinely worked to bring these dear brothers and sisters here. Those who have gathered our Zoom friends, you, you divinely work to bring us, oh God. Yes, we, we were taught our responsibility is to confess our sin to you and to those we've sinned against. We know that, God, but you, your love lavished us with a robe of righteousness, a ring of status with you, the most high God, that we are made family, we are 
We will never be separated from you in this life or for all eternity. Oh, what grace and what glory. Thank you, God. Thank you. We don't have any more precious words than that or fancy words. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Christ, the older brother, to die for us. Thank you for giving us a ministry that that it just has to get outside the walls of this room. It has to. We know that, Lord. So please fill our hearts again with this lavish grace that we first met for some of us many years ago. And move our hands and our feet, our minds, our eyes, our hearts, God, to love lost people, people that matter so much to you. God, please give us those divine appointments. I pray that your house would be full and that rejoicing in heaven will be nonstop until the day you bring us home. We pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. 